Warring kingdoms, saving the world, defying fate. These are cool themes that we see very often in JRPGs, but sometimes I want to get away from that heavy stuff and just chill with a low stakes adventure, a game where I don't feel pressured and can just plod along at my own pace. Thankfully, we're covered there too. So I'm going to share seven easily accessible JRPGs that I've played that I also think are defined by their relaxing experience. And we'll start this off with Dragon Quest XI. Now I realise that the story of DQ11 is very much rooted around the theme of light defeats the darkness, but the way it's structured never makes you feel that you're in a rush to do so. The gameplay loop around those opening sections felt more akin to solving individual problems in far off lands rather than attempting to blot out the ultimate evil. But it's perfect as it pretty much sets the tone for what the majority of DQ11 is all about. Travelling around a vast world at your own leisure and enjoying this adventure that you're on rather than feeling pressured to end it all in record time. Many elements in DQ11 positively contribute to that idea as well, like the colourful characters who join you. There are humorous moments aplenty and the art direction brings those events to life even more. Game mechanics in of themselves are very simple for the most part and there's plenty off the beaten path to find. Though this is not an open world game, there's various avenues that the player can find themselves lost in without any warning. However, I've mentioned this very recently in fact, but it wasn't immediately apparent to me how comfortable this game was, as it took another JRPG that I was playing concurrently to drill home the contrast. In combination with DQ11, I was also playing Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne, and the difference between the two in terms of tone and atmosphere couldn't be more stark. While in Nocturne I was consistently stressing over losing hours of progress to a bad random encounter or racking my head over the dreaded floor traps, I found that that never occurred in DQ11. It's not a lack of polish on Nocturne's part, it's simply the more old school approach it adopted in tandem with how difficult the games are anyway. So after I finished Nocturne and truly got stuck in with DQ11 once again, I found myself appreciating its comforting embrace all the more. It's what I needed at that time. The polish, the atmosphere, the light-hearted cast of characters, it all came together in this refreshing syrup that nulled the senses, allowing me to just kick back and enjoy the adventure. Next on the list is one of my favourite games that I played last year, in Sarkana of Rice and Ruin. This neat little farming sim hybrid came from the minds of a small Japanese developer in Edelweiss, headed by two main members who took it upon themselves to not only create a charming and ambitious play on Japanese folklore, but to also research the intricacies of rice cultivation itself to deliver as accurate an experience as possible. Sakuna, as I've mentioned, is a farming hybrid, and it's split between two distinct modes. The first is side-scrolling action-based gameplay through 2.5D levels where you're taking down enemies via the titular heroine Sakuna, while also mixing in the odd bit of platforming. The other part sees you returning to your main hub and growing rice over a four-phase season. And it's mostly the rice farming that pushes Sakuna into this list. It's an integral part of the game as it's the only method by which Sarkana can level up, and you'll have to learn the systems on offer to grow as much quality rice as you can over each year. This will see you partake in tasks relevant to actual rice cultivation, like tilling the land, managing water levels, applying fertilizer at optimum points, eliminating pests, harvesting, and freshing the grain itself. This gameplay loop of finding items on your adventures and then applying it directly to your farming forms the core of the experience in Sarkana. This is very much a game where patience is rewarded. You can get other characters to do the tasks for you, but you're encouraged to do it yourself, as not only are they less skilled than Sarkana, owing to the fact that she is a goddess of harvest, but as you do more, you learn skills that make the future seasons less taxing, thus allowing you to more easily grow higher quality crop. And for me personally, even at the start, this never felt boring. It was oddly fulfilling keeping a close eye on the rice throughout each season and making sure that I was acting correctly at each point. You'll realise that this game actually offers a very deep and satisfying system. Combine this with the beautiful presentation of its world and its comforting music, and Sarkana is without doubt one of the most wholesome gaming experiences I've had in recent memory. Now this might seem like an odd one, but I only remember having a good time with this. I played through Kingdom Hearts 1, Chain of Memories, and Kingdom Hearts 2 in late 2019 in preparation for Kingdom Hearts 3. 
which I didn't end up playing until early 2021 anyway. But that's beside the point. I at least wanted to play some of the Kingdom Hearts games before jumping into what was supposedly the climax of the series up till that point. And though Kingdom Hearts 2 was undoubtedly the better game in my eyes, the first one had a refreshing charm to it, a sort of beauty and simplicity. Before Xehanort, Nobodies and Keyblade Masters, the premise itself was fairly straightforward. You ride your gummy ship to various worlds, take out the Heartless and seal the keyholes, all the while living out every 90s child's dream by journeying through reimagined Disney-inspired worlds meeting various recognisable faces along the way. Talking about recognisable faces, you're even travelling with two of the most iconic Disney mascots in Donald and Goofy who develop a great chemistry with Sora over the journey. Just like in DQ11, there's a lot of humorous and goofy moments here. Nice pun. For me, Kingdom Hearts 1 cements its status as a comfortable experience near on immediately. After being snatched away from Destiny Islands, Sora finds himself in the quaint little hub world of Traverse Town, a land of eternal night that is undoubtedly calming. It's quiet, you can see the stars, and the music really rams home the idea of jumping into a strange new world, not threatening per se, but layered in mystery and a desire to explore. Even though the story in Kingdom Hearts does ramp up the more it progresses, I found myself just enjoying the more mellow experience it's offered, especially in regards to the worlds, and that's why I've put it on this list. Up next is Eternal Sonata, a game that I'm hoping one day receives some sort of remaster. It probably won't happen, but a man can dream. And how apt to use the word dream, as that's pretty much the premise of Eternal Sonata. You play through the events of this imagined world created by the brain of famous Polish pianist Frederick Chopin, engaging with a colourful cast of characters who are inspired by music itself. Beat, jazz, allegretto, viola, Eternal Sonata is rooted in the theme of music, and more importantly, how it can make someone feel. The limitless potential of music is reflected in this world, brought to life with fantastical areas and a vibrant art style, not to mention supported by a fantastic OST. Eternal Sonata is once again a journey where the theme is fairly serious as it explores the boundary between dreams, reality, and the issues that come with that. But for the most part, the structure it takes on is very much rooted in light-hearted moments between the cast as they push on with their adventure. It was undoubtedly a very long time ago that I played Eternal Sonata, over a decade in fact, but one thing I do remember is how charmed I was by this game, and that mostly came down to how comfortable it made me feel. Moving to Gust now, and spoilers, there will be another game from them, but we're starting with Blue Reflection Second Light, which released late last year. This was my first experience with the franchise outside of the anime, and I was pleasantly surprised. Though Gust generally have a knack to make games that appeal to my tastes anyway, I was quietly apprehensive that maybe this one wouldn't be for me. Within two hours, I knew that was not going to be the case. Blue Reflection Second Light is what I describe as beauty in simplicity. It's split between two areas. You have a team of magical girls that gradually grows over time, and with them, you explore the various heartscapes that pop up over the course of the story. However, more of your time will be dedicated to the social aspect, where you'll witness a bunch of events between the cast members. Whether it's going on dates, creating stuff around the school, or just bumping into random events, these are peppered all over the place. And you realise quickly that Blue Reflection Second Light, as many Gus games are, is highly character focused. It's not so much the adventure as it is the chemistry between the group and how they grow together. That's one reason why the game is so enjoyable and also why it's so relaxing. In your safe haven, that being the school, you're free to jump around and chill with all the other girls who are going about their day. It just feels like you're living out your life more than anything else, despite being marooned in the middle of nowhere. But this idea of a relaxing and carefree approach is also notable in the heartscapes themselves. Some of them are beautifully designed. Simple in terms of level structure, sure, but in terms of actual aesthetic, they are gorgeous to look at. I found myself just running around these areas for the heck of it, especially when combined with the music. It's once again a game that does have some fairly heavy themes, but the majority of it is tied to this idea of a group of girls chilling and just doing their thing. Now I said there was going to be another Gust game, and here it is. How can you mention relaxing JRPG without even giving attention to the Atelier series? Pretty much all of these games, or at least the ones without a time limit, are the shining example of what JRPG comfort food is. And for me, I'm going to be going for the first Atelier Sophie as the most relaxing of the six I've played thus far. The premise is as simple as it gets. Sophie is the alchemist of Kirk and Bell following in her grandmother's footsteps, but she sucks. She meets a book called Plactor, who doesn't suck, who offers to mentor her in exchange for Sophie getting her memories back via finding more recipes. That's the narrative right there. 
In terms of high stakes adventure, it's not really here. In fact, you're spending most of your time in the same place you started, Sophie's home, and you only go outside of your pals to get new materials to bring back for synthesis. And that's pretty much it. You're not pressed to do anything within a certain time period, you're free to wander around and do whatever you want, whenever you want. But if it sounds overly simplistic, that's far from the truth. Rather, Sophie allows all its other elements to flow into its alchemy system, which is one of the best I've seen so far. Though it's admittedly a bit difficult to get used to if you're partially colorblind like myself, the actual depth on offer is excellent. The intuitive grid-based system is introduced for the first time here, and it forms the basis of the entire Mysterious trilogy, so if you like Sophie and what it offers, you've got plenty more to experience further down the line. But what makes this so relaxing is how addicting it is. The gameplay loop of find materials, come back to the atelier and make ever more powerful items is the cornerstone of the experience. You'll find that you want to do this. And the more you partake in alchemy, the more the game rewards you. For example, more powerful items means that you'll have a better time in the overworld when it comes to fights. But more often than not, you'll find yourself plugging away at recipes because it's just fun and you won't have a care in the world to do anything else. In the times you do leave the atelier, you'll be discovering new cauldrons that enhance the experience further, and witnessing the individual stories of other characters around the village, which is also a highlight of this game. Though it may lack in story, Atelier Sophie doesn't really need it. It's a coming-of-age journey that is the epitome of charm and comfort wrapped in one soft cotton ball. And the last game on this list is Trails in the Sky First Chapter. For a series as heavy on its lore and interconnectivity as the Trail series is, Sky First Chapter is notably low-key compared to the others. This game, for the most part, is a pair of junior bracers in Estelle and Joshua travelling across the land of La Belle in their quest to become fully-fledged bracers. Can't get simpler than that. It's only during their adventures where they become encased in the happening surrounding the Sky Arc, which naturally leads to the later developments. But really, Sky First Chapter is one of the more comfortable experiences you're going to find in a traditional JRPG, or at least the ones I've played. Once again, it's got some heavy themes here, but the trajectory of the journey alleviates a lot of that pressure, and you're just enjoying your time travelling around the world. Heck, at times you even find a spare moment for a picnic. Combine that with the introductions of some of the best characters within the entirety of the series, and Sky First Chapter acts as a brilliant introduction to the Trail series in general, flickering slowly but gradually growing into something much greater. The music is once again on point, as it generally is with Sound Team JDK, and the combat itself is fairly simple for the most part. You've also got some excellent side content on offer over a fairly linear adventure, so there's not much backtracking to be had, and the art style is simple yet charming as many Falcon games from that era were. Anyone who knows me is well aware of my love for this series, and though Sky First Chapter is not my personal favourite, it is without a doubt a comforting adventure that opens the gates to something that is unrivaled in scale. And there we go guys, 7 JRPGs that I've played that I feel are defined by their relaxing experiences. I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next week. Peace.